So our, our next person is actually a keynote. It's Kathy McWorris Rogers, who's just entered her 10th year of uh, Congress. And what's different than what you have on your, um, your agenda is we're actually going to do this as an interview with Peter Cook from Bloomberg Television. So um, this will be a, another interesting dynamic dialogue like you, you just experienced. One of the great things that um, uh, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers has done is she has become the head of the um, Republican Caucus. And when she started, for all of those in the room who are busy tweeting, looking at your Facebook page, using social media, there was less than a 30% interest in social media being used by Congress when she first uh, took the position. And now they have over 90% of Congress is now using some form of social media. Um, since you have your computer in front of you, if you want to go look at her Twitter feed or her Facebook page, she really knows how to use the medium. And um, we, I know I not only appreciate that because it's a faster way for those of us who sit in Washington to understand how to use this, but it also makes me think someday there's probably another sitcom or drama out there with all the staff chasing their members trying to make sure they get all their tweets right. So um, please welcome Congresswoman Morris Rogers and Peter Cook. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Glad you all survived the snow. And Congresswoman, thank you for making thank it you. as well, surviving the House Republican Conference this morning, yeah, just right. leaving the closed door <laughs> session. How's the herding of the cats going? Oh, my. You all, it's 246 Republicans in one room who, who have all kinds of uh, ideas as to what's priority and what we should be doing. But really, you know, for, for the Republicans uh, with this uh, larger majority in the House, it's an exciting time about what's possible. And I think that is what. Uh, Makes me excited to be here. We, I want to hear from you too, um, but you know we're going to talk internet and technology and innovation. And you know what? We can use the healthy do dose of that on Capitol Hill as we approach problem solving and as and as we just approach how we as uh, representatives do our job. So, uh, you know, and that's. That's what I'm hoping to bring for the House Republican Conference, too. Well, let me ask you a little bit about your, your, your personal use of technology and the role it's playing up on Capitol Hill for, for House Republicans in particular. You're one of the top leaders there, the highest ranking uh, woman in the House Republican Conference. And uh, first of all, you've made a big effort with your colleagues to try and bring technology on board. It was not that long ago that Ted right. Stevens was talking about the series of tubes. Yes, uh, We've come a little bit since then. Give me... Realistically, your fellow members, how tech savvy are they really? Well, I would just, uh, we're, we're learning all the time. Um, in the last year, we did over 200 training sessions. Uh, so this is a priority and, and, and they are coming, the members are staff, so there's a desire to learn. But I would just uh, reflect very quickly that I think you all recognize in the last 10 years what has happened as it relates to technology uh, and new tools. It's just incredible across the board. And bringing that to Capitol Hill needs to be more of a focus. And uh, when I was, I was first elected to Congress in 2004, uh, and you think about even back in 2004, you know, that was, uh, you know, before we were using Twitter, uh, you know, uh, Net Netflix streaming, you know, it was just a lot has changed even in the last 10 years. I was elected to leadership five years ago, and my goal uh, and my priority in being a part of the leadership team was to really help bring the Republicans into the 21st century and to, um, and to get us not just using these tools, but thinking more creatively as to how we solve problems. So yeah, it's as, it, was, it started out as fundamental as just getting our members to sign up using Twitter and Facebook. And, uh, and, and last week during the State of the Union, uh, Facebook actually said that it was a watershed moment uh, for the use of the members were using these tools uh, to help communicate messages. I, I get excited about the way that uh, these tools can revolutionize the relationship that I have as a representative with the people that I represent. And I, and, and I find that it's just so much easier even you know coming from washington state uh which is at the other end of the country uh here in washington dc to be able to have a, a conversation in real time um more personal with a larger group um it, it really does change the relationship that i have with the people that i represent and and so i think there's there's just the basics of getting the members, the staff, to use these tools. Um, and there's even more potential. And again, if you have ideas, uh, or if you'd like to come talk with 
me or my team or and um, I saw you working it out with Megan yes. Megan Smith. The CTO is coming soon, right? We're doing that all the time, having uh, different uh, leaders um, come in and, and, and just educate us on what's possible. But then I also think about the relationship that uh, the average person has with their government, whether it is contacting someone on Capitol Hill, where too often it's still... Uh, the response is a form letter two weeks after the fact, you know, when they sent an email. <laughs> this is one of my, my next big things to conquer is to make, you know, is to update that whole constituent uh, correspondence type um, system that we have. But even just within the federal government, you know, people can be receiving life changing letters uh, from someone in the federal government that's going to impact their lives, their businesses, and yet, uh, trying to get a hold of someone to get answers can be extremely difficult. Uh, so I think there's huge potential there. But then also just how we deliver services. Uh, and I get excited about what's possible. Uh, let's start imagining what a 21st century VA should look like or a 21st century IRS. You know, let's, and, I, and I think it really gets us beyond the traditional left versus right or Republican versus Democrat debate to, you know, the future. And... Uh, and, and getting us to a place where we can think, okay, what does a 21st century VA look like? I, I uh, had ZocDoc. I don't know how many of you have heard of ZocDoc. I have a lot of you. <laughs> you know, but they came um, knocking on my door after the whole situation related to the VA broke. Um, you know, the, the waiting list, the number of veterans that were having to wait over 30 days for an appointment. And they basically they just said, you know what, we think we can help. And this uh, ZocDoc was founded by a guy who was on an airplane, his uh, eardrum exploded, and he needed an appointment. And he was being told, you're going to have to wait like five days to see your doctor, and it's killing him. And he went, so now there's an app where they, uh, you know, you can go to the app, and well, what they found is that 25 to 30% of doctor's appointments never are filled because people don't show. So there's, there's, you know, if, we, if you can capture those appointments and match them with the people that are needing to, an appointment, it just makes sense, right? And, they, and they've done it, and they've done it successfully. They approach the VA and say, you know what, we could help. And of course, what, the, what is the response from the VA? You know, we have, uh, there were like 37 different reasons as to why, you know, we can't do it. I mean, they're still, they're still working. They're trying to, um, you know, they're, they're not giving up on this. But this is, this is just an easy example I think one that we all recognize um, we could do better, we could um, serve our veterans better, we could get them the, the, you know, the appointments that they need, the, the care that they need in a more efficient, more effective way. And uh, we need to be embracing what technology and innovation can do as far as really um, changing the way and improving the way that government often delivers uh, services. There's a, been a conventional wisdom, and I'm going to let you shoot it down if you want to, that, that Democrats are more tech savvy. They've got closer ties to Silicon Valley, that they, they get this stuff better. Tell me why that's wrong. Well, I would, uh, I would suggest to you that it is the Republicans that really believe in a bottom-up approach to problem solving, believe in uh, going out there and seeing what you can do, uh, for the most part, uh, a, a more minimal role, a limited role for the federal government so that you as an individual and a group of people that have an idea as to a way that you can improve people's lives can make that happen. And uh, so often, I think, although well-intentioned, uh, whether it's laws or regulations that come from Washington, D.C., the one-size-fits-all, it doesn't allow for the freedom and the, the opportunity that an individual or a, a startup uh, needs in order, or the flexibility that they need in order to be successful. And that's where the Republicans really believe in empowering uh, individuals and, and those startups. And that's, uh, I like to think that it's, it's the Republicans that have long been the party that's advocating for, uh, you know, uh, more, more freedom, more opportunity, uh, more flexibility, uh, rather than the top-down approach from Washington, D.C. I'll get into a couple of policy issues in just okay. a second, but uh, take us outside the beltway to your district in eastern yes. Washington. What's the state of the Internet 
in eastern Washington. When did you get on, on the family orchard? When did you right. guys get broadband? How many of your constituents have access to high-speed uh, digital lines right now? Right. Well, very proud to come from Washington State. Now, I represent eastern Washington, uh, which is, uh, I border Idaho from the Canadian border down to the Oregon border, Spokane to Walla Walla. Certainly on the west side of the state, you know, we're very proud of uh, some of the, the anchor companies like Microsoft and Amazon and, and other, and, and just the number of startups. We're, we're, but there's a, there's a growing tech sector in Spokane, a growing number of startups, some angel investors that are taking seriously uh, uh, you know, the potential, the opportunity that it would bring for people in Eastern Washington and wanting to, to make it happen. Um, we, yeah, we have a lot to offer. Maybe I'll just do the sales pitch a little bit. You know, we have a lower cost of living. Uh, we have abundant, uh, we have more land. We have a, a skilled workforce. We have five universities and colleges uh, between Washington State University and Eastern Washington and Whitman. And so there's lots of potential there. Um, but, you know, we're still somewhat looking at Seattle and saying, okay, come on over to uh, Spokane, take, you know, give us a look. Um, and, and I do also represent a lot of uh, rural areas. Spokane is the largest city in my congressional district. It's about 280,000. And so I have uh, 10 counties. And, and in those rural communities, you know, it is, I still represent some areas that do not have the, the real access to the, the high-speed internet, uh, the broadband is still being deployed and there's still more work to be done to reach those rural areas. And, you know, I used the, the VA example earlier. Um, I have a lot of veterans that live in the rural parts of the district that I represent. And, and if they could actually get access um, to um, some of the telemedicine, tele, um, you know, the video conferencing that is now available, um, it could go a long way. So we still have some work to do. Still have some work to do. And what, what's your sense about the role the federal government needs to play in that? How much help should Washington be providing to those rural communities in your district that right now are struggling to, to stay as current as their, their colleagues around the country? Well, I have, I, I do believe that the, the internet broadband is uh, similar to, is important infrastructure similar to water and sewer systems that we have in those rural communities. And so as we think about building that basic infrastructure, I think it's important that we're, we're looking at all aspects of that. And as far as the role of the federal government, uh, you know, I have supported efforts in the past to, to help um, make that possible and to help it make it possible for those local communities to afford to be able to do those investments. And, um, and I think, you know, whether it's uh, the Universal Service Fund and some of those that are um, committed to the rural areas, I think there is a role for, for them as we move forward. Let's talk about a couple of policy issues because I know you're going to be tight on time getting back up to Capitol Hill. You're on the Energy and Commerce Committee, deals mm -hmm. with the whole uh, breadth of the U.S. economy and, and regulatory issues there, oversight, including the FCC. Yes. Um, you and uh, some of your colleagues, uh, Greg Walden and Chairman Upton, this, uh, the fight over net neutrality. How is this going to play out now with Congress looking to get step in here and with the FCC poised to move perhaps as soon as next month? Well, first and foremost, I would I would emphasize that this is, this is an important debate that we're having, and it's a healthy debate. Um, and um, I think, as I said earlier, you know, a lot has changed in the last 10 years. And our laws need to be updated to reflect the 21st century. Uh, I think there's a number of our laws that really need to be brought into the 21st century. And uh, this is one where we need to figure out where that, that middle ground is. As a, as a representative um, for the people that, of Eastern Washington, I, I believe that it is very important that Congress is, is engaged and is making the, the decisions related to what the laws of the land should be. And, uh, and yes, and there's an important role for the FCC in, in implementing and, and um, and passing the reg regulations. So 
Um, but this is more I mean, of a role for Congress needs to step in here. If there's confusion about this, is Congress's role to clear this up? Well, I do believe that it is important that Congress, I, I do. I think that, and I think you um, are going to have better access. Um, you're going to be able to, to meet with your representatives, make the case, help us better understand, and make smarter decisions than sometimes you get out of a, a regulatory agency. It's just the, the reality of how they work. Uh, there's more transparency and there's more opportunities uh, on Capitol Hill to, to make the case. I think that the, the principles that have been laid out uh, in both the House and the Senate, and I recognize uh, the hearings last week were, were pretty hot, um, but I think that the, the, I, I would just encourage you that this is, this is, this is a healthy debate, and, this is, and you want this debate to take place in Congress. You want it to take place among your elected representatives where you have an opportunity to go to them, to, to um, appeal to them, and, and they're gonna make decisions as they, they see are in the best interest of those that they represent. And, and so uh, I am hopeful that we'll be able to find some middle ground here that continues to encourage both investment and innovation. And, and finding that middle ground may right now seem, you know, um, a little beyond our reach, but this is a process. And this is uh, the process of making sure that our laws reflect the world in which we live and that our laws are ones that are going to uh, continue to encourage the type of innovation that we want to have in our economy moving forward. Safe to say that Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden have the full backing of the Republican leadership in the House to, to take this to the finish line? We're going we're gonna, to you know, be working on this together. And, um, and certainly there's a lot of considerations um, um, and where you know, this is one of those issues that we're going to continue to, to discuss as to what is, what's the best way forward. Another very hot topic at this conference, and of course here in Washington right now, cybersecurity in the wake of what happened at Sony. At, at Bloomberg, this is a, a giant story, the, the fact that this is, uh, the business sector has been targeted in this way. What's your sense right now uh, from the leadership perspective about how big a priority cybersecurity legislation is in this Congress for you all and your own concern about not only what happened at Sony, but right. the risk out there to, to the private sector, much less right. the government? Right. Um, well, yes, there's, there's Sony and there's other uh, retailers, Target, and, and others that have been uh, tar targets of uh, cyber attacks. Um, this, I, I think that this is a, an issue where there's an opportunity to come together, actually in a bipartisan way, to address some, really, some, some realities that we face and some concerns that need to be addressed. We were down, the, the president had uh, a joint meeting with uh, Republican and Democrat leadership last week at the White House. And this was one of the five priorities that he laid out and one where, at least around that table, there was some uh, uh, Speaker, desire. Speaker Boehner's identified it as one of the four areas that he sees for right. bipartisan cooperation. We also have the Patriot Act expiring in June, mm -hmm. which gives us an opportunity, well, which will force um, Congress to act upon some of the you know, data collection and other uh, provisions within the Patriot Act. Do you see these two issues merging together on, on June 1st and being sort of forcing action on the part of Congress? Well, I, I do think that the, uh, I, 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 certainly some aspects of cybersecurity will be um, a part of the Patriot Act. I'm, I'm someone who, uh, I voted for the Patriot Act, but, also believed it was very important that there was the expiration of the Patriot Act and the provisions that would ensure that we as, as members of Congress and could, could analyze a few years down the road, okay, is this what we, in, not just what we intended, but is this working uh, effectively? And, and, and now uh, where we find ourselves, I think it was very important that those provisions expire because I think we've all learned, you know, um, you think, you know, the data collection is just one piece, but I've been in a, a number of meetings and briefings where how it was implemented was way beyond what anyone's, you know, the authors of the Patriot Act ever envisioned. And, and, and we're in a position now where we can actually ask 
some of those questions. And, and I've, there's, I've... There's been a pretty notable split among some of your Republican colleagues. Not everyone's on the same page on this. That's, that's true. Um, I'm, I'm someone that believes the, we need to, um, first of all, this is a, again, this is a, a debate that, you know, where, how we find the balance between protecting civil liberties and then also the, the real threats that face the country and how we go about, uh, per, you know, protecting Americans and the safety and security of this country. It, you know, it is, um, it's, it's a balancing act. And, and I believe that it is very important that Congress, uh, the House and the Senate, the intelligence committees are really providing the kind of oversight that we need to ensure that those civil liberties are also being respected and protected in this process. And um, there's been enough examples raised where I think we all have some concerns about what exactly uh, is, is being collected. And, and I've uh, supported efforts in the past to demand that those, those questions be answered. Do you know how you're going to vote yet on the, uh, issue, on the issue of reauthorization on June 1st? No, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in the camp that I'm going to wait um, to see you know, how, we, how we craft something and uh, how we find that balance. Let me ask you finally in our time remaining about something you were talking to Megan Smith about, and mm -hmm. that's something that just launched, uh, the Diversifying Tech Caucus. Yes. Tell me what this, uh, what this is and how it is you plan to, to actually help diversify the okay. tech workforce of, of tomorrow. What is it Congress can do on a bipartisan basis on this front? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, this is a, a caucus that was launched yesterday. Uh, so um, breaking, news. breaking news right here uh, between the House and the Senate and Republicans and Democrats. And I, I think it's uh, hey, as we celebrate technology and innovation and just uh, everything that it's doing in our lives, I think it's important that we're also making sure that, you know, whether it's women or minorities or veterans or other those with disabilities that we're just making sure that we are having a conversation um, spending some time um, perhaps some round tables or some uh, briefings where we just take a, a look at dive a little deeper as to you know, maybe some of the barriers that exist uh, you know we celebrate the number of startups uh, tech startups and yet only three percent of them are with women and and as um, someone that has long been involved in trying to get, you know, encourage more women to go into the STEM fields. I think it's just another opportunity for us to be uh, looking at, you know, what are some of the perceived and real barriers that we can address. And, and I hope that we'll find some ideas, you know, through the years I've worked on legislation. You, you ask, you know, so what can we do on Capitol Hill? You know, I've, um, I think there's a number of things that we can do to, part of it is increase in awareness. Um, I think, you know, and that is something we very, you know, much can do. Um, but then there's also legislation, whether it is, um, you know, different uh, incentives or scholarships I've, I've worked on in the past to encourage young people to pursue um, STEM educations. I've worked on legislation to encourage the adjunct professors or we call them content specialists to go into the high schools and, and talk, you know, and to help teach and, and just help connect and, and uh, and especially as I talk to women or, or uh, young women, junior high and high school age, so often they, you know, as you think, as, as you ask them, so what do you want to do with your life? You know, they, wanted, they want to have a career where they're going to make a difference for the long term. They want to work on a team, uh, you know, th but they don't associate science, technology, engineering and math being careers that are going to lead to this outcome. And so there's more, there's certainly more work that needs to be done. Uh, the opportunities are great right now. And as you think about how we, how we um, create more opportunities in America for everybody, no matter who they are, no matter their background, their walk of life, I, I think there's just huge, huge potential here. Obviously, we're still, we're still uh, at the beginning stages of what um, the internet and technology and innovation has to offer. We've come a long way from the series of tubes. Yes. Uh, thanks very much for the time. I appreciate it. I know you got to get back up to the hill. So, Kathy McMorris Rogers, thanks very much. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you very much.